Section 41 of The Promulgation of Universal Peace, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. The Promulgation of Universal Peace, Volume 1, by Abdul Baha Abbas. Section 41. 2. June 9, 1912, at Baptist Temple, Broad and Burke Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Notes by Edna McKinney. I am greatly pleased to be present this evening. Truly, this is a spiritual gathering. I perceive the fragrances of the heavenly kingdom among you. Devotion to God, sincere intention, and spiritual love. Glad tidings. From the time of the creation of Adam to this day, there have been two pathways in the world of humanity, one the natural or the materialistic, the other the religious or spiritual. The pathway of nature is the pathway of the animal realm. The animal acts in accordance with the requirements of nature, follows its own instincts and desires. Whatever its impulses and proclivities may be, it has the liberty to gratify them, yet it is a captive of nature. It cannot deviate in the least degree from the road nature has established. It is utterly minus spiritual susceptibilities, ignorant of divine religion and without knowledge of the kingdom of God. The animal possesses no power of ideation or conscious intelligence. It is a captive of the senses and deprived of that which lies beyond them. It is subject to what the eye sees, the ear hears, the nostrils sense, the taste detects and touch reveals. These sensations are acceptable and sufficient for the animal. But that which is beyond the range of the senses that realm of phenomena through which the conscious pathway to the kingdom of God leads, the world of spiritual susceptibilities and divine religion, of these the animal is completely unaware, for in its highest station it is a captive of nature. One of the strangest things witnessed is that the materialists of today are proud of their natural instincts and bondage. They state that nothing is entitled to belief and acceptance except that which is sensible or tangible. By their own statements, they are captives of nature, unconscious of the spiritual world, uninformed of the divine kingdom, and unaware of heavenly bestowals. If this be a virtue, the animal has attained it to a superlative degree. For the animal is absolutely ignorant of the realm of spirit and out of touch with the inner world of conscious realization. The animal would agree with the materialist in denying the existence of that which transcends the senses. If we admit that being limited to the plane of the senses is a virtue, the animal is indeed more virtuous than man for it is entirely bereft of that which lies beyond, absolutely oblivious of the kingdom of God and its traces, whereas God has deposited within the human creature an illimitable power by which he can rule the world of nature. Consider how all other phenomenal existence and beings are captives of nature, the sun, that colossal center of our solar system, the giant stars and planets, the towering mountains, the earth itself and its kingdoms of life lower than the human. All are captives of nature except man. No other created thing can deviate in the slightest degree from obedience to natural law. The sun in its glory and greatness, millions of miles away, is held prisoner in its orbit of universal revolution, captive of universal natural control. 
Man is the ruler of nature. According to natural law and limitation, he should remain upon the earth. But behold how he violates this command and soars above the mountains in aeroplanes. He sails in ships upon the surface of the ocean and dives into its depths in submarines. Man makes nature his servant, harnesses the mighty energy of electricity, for instance, and imprisons it in a small lamp for his uses and convenience. He speaks from the east to the west through a wire. He is able to store and preserve his voice in a phonograph. Though he is a dweller upon earth, he penetrates the mysteries of starry worlds inconceivably distant. He discovers latent realities within the bosom of the earth, uncovers treasures, penetrates secrets and mysteries of the phenomenal world, and brings to light that which, according to nature's jealous laws, should remain hidden, unknown, and unfathomable. Through an ideal inner power, man brings these realities forth from the invisible plane to the visible. This is contrary to nature's law. It is evident, therefore, that man is ruler over nature's sphere and province. Nature is inert. Man is progressive. Nature has no consciousness. Man is endowed with it. Nature is without volition and acts perforce, whereas man possesses a mighty will. Nature is incapable of discovering mysteries or realities, whereas man is especially fitted to do so. Nature is not in touch with the realm of God. Man is attuned to its evidences. Nature is uninformed of God. Man is conscious of him. Man acquires divine virtues. Nature is denied them. Man can voluntarily discontinue vices. Nature has no power to modify the influence of its instincts. Altogether, it is evident that man is more noble and superior, that in him there is an ideal power surpassing nature. He has consciousness, volition, memory, intelligent power, divine attributes and virtues, of which nature is completely deprived, bereft, and minus. Therefore, man is higher and nobler by reason of the ideal and heavenly force latent and manifest in him. How strange then it seems that man, notwithstanding his endowment with this ideal power, will descend to a level beneath him and declare himself no greater than that which is manifestly inferior to his real station. God has created such a conscious spirit within him that he is the most wonderful of all contingent beings. In ignoring these virtues, he descends to the material plane, considers matter the ruler of existence, and denies that which lies beyond. Is this virtue? In its fullest sense, this is animalistic, for the animal realizes nothing more. In fact, from this standpoint, the animal is the greater philosopher because it is completely ignorant of the kingdom of God, possesses no spiritual susceptibilities, and is uninformed of the heavenly world. In brief, this is a view of the pathway of nature. The second pathway is that of religion, the road of the divine kingdom. It involves the acquisition of praiseworthy attributes, heavenly illumination, and righteous actions in the world of humanity. This pathway is conducive to the progress and uplift of the world. It is the source of human enlightenment, training and ethical improvement, the magnet which attracts the love of God because of the knowledge of God it bestows. This is the road of the holy manifestations of God, for they are in reality the foundation of the divine religion of oneness. There is no change or transformation in this pathway. 
It is the cause of human betterment, the acquisition of heavenly virtues, and the illumination of mankind. Alas, that humanity is completely submerged in imitations and unrealities, notwithstanding the truth of divine religion has ever remained the same. Superstitions have obscured the fundamental reality. The world is darkened and the light of religion is not apparent. This darkness is conducive to differences and dissensions. Rites and dogmas are many and various. Therefore, discord has arisen among the religious systems, whereas religion is for the unification of mankind. True religion is the source of love and agreement amongst men, the cause of the development of praiseworthy qualities but the people are holding to the counterfeit and imitation negligent of the reality which unifies so they are bereft and deprived of the radiance of religion they follow superstitions inherited from their fathers and ancestors to such an extent has this prevailed that they have taken away the heavenly light of divine truth and sit in the darkness of imitations and imaginations. That which was meant to be conducive to life has become the cause of death. That which should have been an evidence of knowledge is now a proof of ignorance. That which was a factor in the sublimity of human nature has proved to be its degradation. Therefore, the realm of the religionist has gradually narrowed and darkened and the sphere of the materialist has widened and advanced for the religionist has held to imitation and counterfeit neglecting and discarding holiness and the sacred reality of religion when the sun sets it is the time for bats to fly they come forth because they are creatures of the night when the lights of religion become darkened, the materialists appear. They are the bats of night. The decline of religion is their time of activity. They seek the shadows when the world is darkened and clouds have spread over it. His Holiness, Baha'u'llah, has risen from the eastern horizon. Like the glory of the sun, he has come into the world. He has reflected the reality of divine religion, dispelled the darkness of imitations, laid the foundation of new teachings, and resuscitated the world. The first teaching of Baha'u'llah is the investigation of reality. Man must seek the reality himself. Forsaking imitations and adherence to mere hereditary forms as the nations of the world are following imitations in lieu of truth and as imitations are many and various differences of belief have been productive of strife and warfare so long as these imitations remain the oneness of the world of humanity is impossible therefore we must investigate the reality in order that by its light the clouds and darkness may be dispelled. Reality is one reality. It does not admit multiplicity or division. If the nations of the world investigate reality, they will agree and become united. Many people and sects in Persia have sought reality through the guidance and teaching of Baha'u'llah. They have become united and now live in a state of agreement and love. Among them there is no longer the least trace of enmity and strife. The Jews were expecting the appearance of the Messiah, looking forward to it with devotion of heart and soul. But because they were submerged in imitations, they did not believe in His Holiness Jesus Christ when He appeared. Finally they rose against Him even to the extreme of persecution and shedding his blood. Had they investigated reality, they would have accepted their promised Messiah. 
these blind imitations and hereditary prejudices have invariably become the cause of bitterness and hatred and have filled the world with darkness and violence of war therefore we must seek the fundamental truth in order to extricate ourselves from such conditions and then with illumined faces find the pathway to the kingdom of god the second teaching of baha'u'llah concerns the unity of mankind all are the servants of god and members of one human family god has created all and all are his children he rears nourishes provides for and is kind to all why should we be unjust and unkind this is the policy of god the lights of which have shone throughout the world his sun bestows its effulgence unsparingly upon all his clouds send down rain without distinction or favor his breezes refresh the whole earth it is evident that humankind without exception is sheltered beneath his mercy and protection some are imperfect they must be perfected the ignorant must be taught the sick healed the sleepers awakened the child must not be oppressed or censured because it is underdeveloped it must be patiently trained the sick must not be neglected because they are ailing nay rather we must have compassion upon them and bring them healing briefly the old conditions of animosity bigotry and hatred between the religious systems must be dispelled and the new conditions of love agreement and spiritual brotherhood be established among them the third teaching of baha'u'llah is that religion must be the source of fellowship the cause of unity and the nearness of god to man if it rouses hatred and strife it is evident that absence of religion is preferable and an irreligious man better than one who professes it according to the divine will and intention religion should be the cause of love and agreement a bond to unify all mankind for it is a message of peace and goodwill to man from god the fourth teaching of baha'u'llah is the agreement of religion and science god has endowed man with intelligence and reason whereby he is required to determine the verity of questions and propositions if religious beliefs and opinions are found contrary to the standards of science they are mere superstitions and imaginations for the antithesis of knowledge is ignorance and the child of ignorance is superstition unquestionably there must be agreement between true religion and science if a question be found contrary to reason faith and belief faith and belief in it are impossible and there is no outcome but wavering and vacillation baha'u'llah has also taught that prejudices whether religious racial patriotic or political are destructive to the foundations of human development prejudices of any kind are the destroyers of human happiness and welfare until they are dispelled the advancement of the world of humanity is not possible yet racial religious and national bias are observed everywhere for thousands of years the world of humanity has been agitated and disturbed by prejudices as long as it prevails warfare animosity and hatred will continue therefore if we seek to establish peace we must cast aside this obstacle for otherwise agreement and composure are not to be attained fifth baha'u'llah sent forth principles of guidance and teaching for economic readjustment regulations were revealed by him which ensure the welfare of the commonwealth as the rich man enjoys his life surrounded by ease and luxuries so the poor man 
must likewise have a home and be provided with sustenance and comforts commensurate with his needs this readjustment of the social economic is of the greatest importance inasmuch as it ensures the stability of the world of humanity and until it is effected happiness and prosperity are impossible sixth baha'u'llah teaches that an equal standard of human rights must be recognized and adopted in the estimation of god all men are equal there is no distinction or preferment for any soul in the dominion of his justice and equity seventh education is essential and all standards of training and teaching throughout the world of mankind should be brought into conformity and agreement a universal curriculum should be established and the basis of ethics be the same eighth a universal language shall be adopted and be taught by all the schools and institutions of the world a committee appointed by national bodies of learning shall select a suitable language to be used as a medium of international communication all must acquire it this is one of the great factors in the unification of man ninth baha'u'llah emphasized and established the equality of man and woman sex is not particularized to humanity it exists throughout the animate kingdoms but without distinction or preference in the vegetable kingdom there is complete equality between male and female of species likewise in the animal plane equality exists all are under the protection of god is it becoming to man that he the noblest of creatures should observe and insist upon such distinction woman's lack of progress and proficiency has been due to her need of equal education and opportunity had she been allowed this equality there is no doubt she would be the counterpart of man in ability and capacity the happiness of mankind will be realized when women and men coordinate and advance equally for each is the complement and helpmeet of the other the world of humanity cannot advance through mere physical powers and intellectual attainments nay rather the holy spirit is essential the divine father must assist the human world to attain maturity the body of man is in need of physical and mental energy but his spirit requires the life and fortification of the holy spirit without its protection and quickening the human world would be extinguished his holiness jesus christ declared quote, let the dead bury their dead End quote. he also said quote, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit End quote. it is evident therefore according to his holiness that the human spirit which is not fortified by the presence of the holy spirit is dead and in need of resurrection by that divine power otherwise though materially advanced to high degrees man cannot attain full and complete progress end of section 41 recording by nicholas james bridgewater recorded in oxford england